I'd like to introduce Sandy Stratton. She's a longtime resident of St. Augustine, Florida, where she, sat, she had the good fortune to be adopted by a Minorcan family. Her early career centered on trauma radiography and com computed tomography. I don't even know what that is. She also works expensive as expensive. Yes. <laughs> Sounds like you'd have a high copay. <laughs> she also works as a software engineer. Sandy has received her bachelor and master's degrees in history from the University of North Florida. She taught a number of uh, a number of at a number of colleges and universities in Northeast Florida. Sandy's historical research interests focus on Florida history, specifically Minorcan history. She has also done extensive research tracing literacy and education in the African American community in the South during and after the Civil War. She has published papers with Florida History Online, as well as the Florida Historical Quarterly. She's a past member of the Minorcan Cultural Society, where she was instrumental in the publication of Kenneth Beeson's from Hottos and Indigo, the Minorcan colony in Florida. Please join me in welcoming Sandy Stratton. Now, video guy, when you cut this video up and get it all ready post-production, take that uh, uh, that applause and put it at the end. It's awesome. <laughs> <laughs> Anybody got bad fruit? I have not. And I apologize for sitting. It's rude. But I can't stand on this knee tonight, so I'm on my throne, I suppose. Um, thank y'all for having me. I appreciate it. What a big crowd. And y'all are going to have a party with an open bar and a saxophone player. This is the world's coolest historical society. <laughs> I've spoken to a fair bucket full, and I've never heard of such. So. Y'all are, are pretty awesome. <laughs> All right, let's talk about Menorkins. Um, I was thinking about my title here, and, and um, for you new Smyrna people, I apologize, because really it should say, um, and basically this is the public um, kind of feel-good, not-so-stiff version of my master's thesis. Um, so I was trying to impress, you know, people like Dan Schaefer. It was awful. He's 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 awesome, but it was awful to go run in that gauntlet. But it really say, it should say Florida's second beachside development because of course the first one, um, even though you know in the long run it failed. Adjust your mic. It's interacting with your jacket. Wow. There we go. I don't play Talk the away. saxophone either. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Oh, thank you. No charge. <laughs> <laughs> My poor sister's over there. Just she's like, oh, I, what was it? Mom used to say, buying books, send them to school. What do they do? Eat the covers. <laughs> so obviously, the first beachside development was here in New Smyrna, and. I think if you go to St. Augustine or St. John's County and you walk around and you talk to the 60,000, I think, I think that's a fair estimate, um, Menorcan descendants. You know, it's like, boo, Turnbull, New Smyrna, it was a horror. Uh. Well, if you were an indentured servant and you had signed a, a, you know, a, a contract of indenture for X number of years, um, and you felt that time, you had served, and you felt that time was up, and you managed to escape to somewhere where your legal status was as free people, you're not going to whip out the contract at some later date and say, oh, look, it was really 12 years, <laughs> or whatever. So um, it's, I would say, almost institutionalized for Menorcans in St. John's County, where the vast majority of them are still um, squatting around up there. Um, but, and the story here is brilliant, and it attracted me to the point I went back to school and got multiple degrees in history and fought like a demon 
to concentrate on Menorcan history, Menorcan history in Florida, um, because it's what, I, I'm like, what a brilliant story. There's nothing better than a good story. I don't care what it is. If it's a good story, there's nothing better. And I thought, what a great story. And these are my people. Literally, they took me in. So look what they've had to go through. And look at New Smyrna. And the history has been done brilliantly. You know, think of the scholarship that's gone on. Pat Griffin and Dan Schaefer. I get to study with those people. I get to study under them. And they nurtured me, but it was not a sexy specialty to come into history with. It's still not. Most people, you know, I was at the um, Historical Research Library in San Augustine and on Avalé Street there, that great old building, and I was up there doing some research one day, and there were people coming and going, and tourists would stick their heads in. What's this about? And one woman came in, and she said, I want to know about the mini orchids. And I'm like, is this some kind of pest control service or some mini orchids? And then I realized, oh, she's talking about the Menorcans. And um, Charles Tingley, the director at the time, I don't know if Charles is still there. Do you know Greg? Where's Greg? He was there somewhere. Anyway, director there for many years. I don't know if he's still there. Awesome guy. Every history book written about San Augustine, Florida, anything, Charles Tingley has helped with for the last 30 something years. But he turned around and pointed at me and I'm like, no, 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 no. I can't fix that. I've got a lot of research to do. But I became, I began to realize as I moved up into graduate school where you're expected to produce original new. You're expected to add to the whole. That's what graduate school is about. You're expected to add something new to the whole. And often the new is about the size of you know, a shirt button or something, but you're expected to do that. And I'm like, I can't add anything new in New Smyrna. This is before the Turnbull letters. Um, happy day that was. But I'm like, I can't add anything new. So I'm like, what am I gonna do? So do I go back to Menorca and look at mm -hmm. what push the Menorcans out of the old world into the new world. And I thought, no, I'm really interested. You know, this is my home. What happened after they came here? Why are there 60,000 of them still wandering around St. Augustine? You know, you, bump, you, you can't swing a cat in St. John's County without hitting a Menorcan. <laughs> so they walked up the road from here. How, what kind of shape were they in? Um, what did they do when they got there? And why have they been a mainstay of St. Augustine, St. John's County, and Florida for such a long time. How did that happen? And um, the first thing I did is really, you know, what makes people leave? It's that push me, pull me, kind of Dr. Z's kind of thing. What pushes somebody to leave the home of generations of their people? What pushed them to leave Menorca, you know, the Mediterranean, the old world? What pushed them to leave there? years of famine, back and forth, French, British, back and forth, French, British, French, British. Yes, we invented mayonnaise, but, you know, we're tired of all these people. Um, and, you know, habitation on um, Menorca, that one island alone, you can trace it back until, you know, far before pre-Roman times. You know, the land you know, how many children? You said you had children, how many you have? Okay, so you're gonna leave your property to them. You've got two acres. So obviously each child gets an acre. So grandchildren, they each have two. You know, it didn't take many generations and suddenly you're leaving a postage stamp. And nowadays that's kind of fine. Um, you know, we've got a town lot, a house that's on it. We pay somebody else to mow it. I, you know, we're kind of fine with that. But if I had to suddenly um, provide subsistence, farming, produce, you know, vittles for my family, mm -hmm. holy cow, you know, suddenly that piece of property has become very, very small. And if I have to produce everything, you know, it's one thing, oh, Publix is not open, I'll run down to the handy bar, <laughs> chuck a milk and a Hershey bar and go back to the house. But there's no Publix, so what do you do? Where do you get your coffee, your orange juice, your milk? And not only today, but tomorrow. And here in the wintertime, we're lucky 
because, you know, uh, I live in Hastings, a <coughs> farming community outside of St. Augustine, and we're just starting our agricultural season now. There are cabbages and potatoes and broccoli and all kinds of things that have already been planted. They've been knocking themselves out up there. But when it gets to the heat of the summer, there's not that much that grows. So how do we survive until not only we can plant again, but to those plants germinate, if we're lucky, get enough water if we get enough rain, and then finally we have something to eat. Now, how do we subsist? Um, and all of that has to happen once they get to St. Augustine. Governor James Grant is a really fascinating character. My mentor, Dr. Dan Schaefer, wrote some brilliant, do yourself a favor and read anything the man wrote, but especially on James Grant because he's the world expert in my opinion. He really gets this guy. And <clears throat> he was the f um, governor of British East Florida, um, which at this point is St. Augustine. And he's like a one-man chamber of commerce. He's ordering liquor and ale and port in um, what do you call them? Barrels. Casks. Uh, think bigger than that. Yeah, supersize your cask. <laughs> you know, because a cask, you know, oh, here's my yo-ho-ho and a bottle of rum. No, we're talking casks that are seven and eight feet high in mm -hmm. diameter. I mean, hundreds of gallons of ale and spirits and stuff. He's ordering shipfuls of this stuff to the point there's the ships are so full they can't get across the sandbar in St. Augustine to offload them. So they have to wait till they get um, like a especially high tide to float it over. Um, this guy is he is out there and he's talking about East Florida. He's the one that gets Turnbull and his his Renville and the others to invest in and take a chance on New Smyrna. Um, because if you think, the Spanish have had Florida for over 200 years, 222 years. And you know, the British come in for that 20 year period. And the Spanish, it was all about military protecting, this was, you know, this part of the coast here between here and St. Augustine is where the, um, the plate ships, the silver ships coming out of South America, um, that's where they make the right turn to go back to Europe, back to Spain. So, you know, as a military presidio, here on the very edge of that Spanish empire, it's important for that. But as, you know, the silver reserves started to fall, St. Augustine wasn't that important. And by the time, the other thing the Spanish were concentrating on was, was religion. And the mission period in Florida and up into Georgia and the Carolinas, um, all things considered for the entire Spanish period, was quite, uh, depends on your point of view. If you're a Native American, it wasn't a good thing. If you're a Spanish person and just, you know, kind of checking the, ticking the box, and, you know, soul saved, you know, converted to Christianity, you know, you're probably looking at, at your mission as a fairly good success. Um, but once the British come in and Grant gets a hold of it, they really did a lot of publicity. Like we would think today about marketing, you know, kind of pushing the product, getting it out there in front of people. I mean, think about it today. We got to, we got social media, you know, we still have some newspapers. Certainly the television is a big marketing tool. Um, and James Grant is just as savvy about the marketing tools of his age, the broadsheet, the newspaper. Uh, he's a great letter writer, which is very important at the time. And he really promotes the heck out of Florida. He really does. And he does a pretty good job. Plus, he puts his money where his mouth was. He started an experimental farm in St. Augustine, just north of the city gates, where you know where the city gates are. Mm -hmm. They're just across from the fort. They're right at the, the, yeah. the north wall of the city around down through their Orange Street. And just beyond those gates, he had like 300 acres. Um, some of it here, some of it there, some up on the Guana. And he starts basically um, Florida's first real experimental farm because he looks north and if you look north to the colonies 
and he's a good, he is your prototypical British gentleman. You know, he knows what the other rich people in the colonies are doing. And what's going on in Virginia? They have made the biggest pile of money on tobacco and other, you know, especially tobacco. Um, tobacco doesn't grow well in Florida. But what does is indigo. And Grant did extensive um, experimentation with indigo. He had very specific ideas about soil types and irrigation. He was much, he was ahead of his time. Just as Thomas Jefferson and um, some of those others kind of founding father people were very much agriculturist at heart. Yeah, they dabbled in politics, but you know, agriculture was their blood. So it was with him. And he solved a lot of the agricultural problems and um, you know, added to his kind of chamber of commerce marketing information. People came from all over. When the Bartrams first came into Florida, they came to see this guy first. They depended on him to help them pick out um, the plantation they eventually ended up with out on the St. John's. Um, and so, and Turnbull, he, he really gets a bad rap with the Menorcans, and I understand it. It makes sense. You can't hold it against the Menorcans. Because if they said, well, he was a really nice guy, and he paid us well, and the food was great. <laughs> um, but, you know, we just got really tired of it and thought we'd go on to St. Augustine. You know, they've got that miniature golf. It's awesome. No, you can't do that. You know, and let's face it. Turnbull was not a farmer. What was Turnbull? Anybody know what he was? He was yeah, he was a doctor. And he wasn't just a physician. He was a Scottish physician. And at that time, as far as Western medicine goes, the very best physicians came from Scotland. That's where they were trained. Um, and that held true up until post-war. Um, so Turnbull was a very good, a very, for his time, he was a brilliant doctor. Um, not so much. Uh, a farmer. He had a great deal of enthusiasm. And just like it had Florida has with so many other people, why do people come here? Why do you come here? The weather. The weather. And so you think if you got great weather, you're going to have great crops, right? Everything just, you're just going to throw seeds on the ground and come back two weeks later and go to the bank. And um, yeah, well, the Turnbull letters, and here's a, a, a thing probably not a lot of people know. But the Turnbull letters um, were found in his castle in Scotland, which they made, Grant made so much money on indigo and cotton, sea on cotton and some other things, mostly indigo. He made so much money that those letters were able to stay where they were all those years. That money he made when he was here, it's, and of course they've diversified and invested in other things, but that seed money, the capital he got from his indigo here in Florida, is still paying for that castle today. Mm -hmm. Those letters made it because of that money. And I just think that's just, wow. So. I, I, I missed something. So, got the money. Grant. 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 Oh, Grant. Grant. So it was possible to make money growing indigo in Florida. That's, that's my point here. My second point is this guy and his fellow investors spent, uh, and we can get down later in the floor, an arm wrestle over conversion rates between, you know, mid-18th century and today, but roughly, you know, give or take, um, Turnbull, and mostly his investors, because he didn't come into it with any money, basically, um, spent $5 million on New Smyrna. Mm -hmm. Transportation, food, clothing, implements, and the list goes on and on. But basically, over the lifetime, from the time Turnbull said, we're going to the new world, and the time it collapsed, $5 million. That's a, I don't know about y'all, that's a lot of money. Um, and they never made back that. They had a couple of good years, especially after they put in the irrigation down here, those lovely canals that still run here through New Smyrna. Um, never mention the canals in St. Augustine, save yourself. Um, <laughs> they get all upset. Um, but 
I think given time that they worked out the irrigation problems, they worked out some of the issues with deg soil degradation. Because how many of you know what indigo looks like? No. No? Well, I brought, uh, oh, there it is. I brought a picture. There. Um, it's a weed. Yeah. A friend of mine up in Kentucky, she said, oh, I want some indigo seeds. And I said, well, I happen to have a conduit to some historical indigo seeds, the who knows how many times great-grandchildren of the indigo grown here in New Smyrna. I, I can get my hands on the little seeds. You go, oh, I want them. And she goes, now, when she, I'm in Kentucky. When should I plant them? And I said, well, don't plant it anywhere you're, you're, not, you know, you're not committed to. I said, this is a weed. It'll take over your world. I said, I don't know how it's going to do with your cold and snow in the winter. It may knock it back. I said, but I know a guy that planted like three seeds in his yard in you know, St. Augustine, and they had to move. So <laughs> <laughs> if you work people hard enough, and these people were planting hard, you can get four crops a year. And in order to make indigo, which is a dye plant, this is part of the spice trade. And I mean, if I say spice trade, what's the first thing you think of? Yeah. That's one thing. What else? Cinnamon. Cinnamon. Okay. Yeah. The bottom line. What do you think about? Money. You think about money. You know, the expensive stuff. Um, and in a world with no refrigeration, spices suddenly take on a whole new meaning and think about it. Um, but the spice trade was not only things we eat, tea and things like that. The spice trade was four things. Spices, food spices, medicines, um, you know, before antibiotics you'd try anything. Um, I, I read a receipt for a prescription basically written in the uh, late 1500s um, in England. It had over 50 natural botanical ingredients in it. 50. Can you imagine? So obviously the spice trade, that was part of it. So do, uh, food stuff, medicines, perfumes, things that make, because in a stinky world it's nice to have something that smells nice. And what's the other thing? Dye stuff. And this is it. Before synthetic dyes, what color are your clothing? Green. They're all They're all yeah. All so is it wool, you know, off-white, white, off-white, off kind of. Right. By the time you get it all processed and everything. But suddenly you can dye it indigo. Wow. Or you can use cochineal and make something red. How? You know, this is the color of royalty. And why? This is a cake of processed indigo, which is modern. This is from India. They still process it in the way they processed it 3,000 years ago. There and in Africa, all over the world, this is still made. Um, have you ever smelled a vat of indigo dye? Like, take one of these, break it up in some water, heat it up, get ready to dye something. This lady back here, she has, because she's like, oh my God. Yeah, because it's horrible. <coughs> Think about, um, I don't know, raw sewage with a soup con of you know, <laughs> dead buzzard. I mean, it's horrible. The first time I smelled it, I thought, like, holy cow, this is my favorite color. And it's like, oh my gosh. I took, uh, there's a guy in St. Augustine who still makes it the original way. And um, he dyed a scarf for me. It's still out back. We're still waiting on the smell of this way. That's got to be 12 years ago. Um, the foliage. Yeah, if you let it. If you let it bloom, it's like any other herb that bolts to flowers, you know, the life cycle is over at that time. So it's the foliage that you ferment was a three tank system. So you throw it in there with some water, let it set. And of course now Florida becomes a great place because now suddenly you have heat, humidity, great atmosphere for fermentation. You take it through two more tanks and then you put all that into kind of these um, muslin bags and just soppy, wet sewage at that point, basically. And you drop, I don't know, a couple of, probably five, six pounds of that into one of those bags. 
and you let it evaporate until it's this consistency. You can't imagine how long in the humid environment of Florida does that take. Um, but a cake this size, and this is about, um, now we're staying in a nice hotel at the beach. I was, I was washing my hands with a cake of soap, and I thought, oh, this is exactly the size of what a cake of indigo would have been. Um, so that cake of soap, that's part of my bill for the night, that cake of indigo, probably in today's money, worth more than a thousand dollars. Yeah, I mean, we're talking big money. So now, now you understand why Governor Grant did, made such a killing. The thing that really knocked him down at New Smyrna was uh, the drought, um, the poorly fed, clothed labor force. Um, and the shipping, because who's going to buy it? You got to get to get it to a market where somebody's going to purchase it. Then you've got money, and that's all Europe. It's got to go back to Europe. There's not enough of a market here. Um, the colonial market up north, yeah, you can sell some up there, but if you're going to sell a sh you know a ship full of indigo, it's got to go to Europe. And by the time you you can get it out of the mosquitoes because y'all got the same, you know, low before the Corps of Engineers came in. Um, you know, it's hard to get a big ship in and out of here. It's almost impossible to get one in and out of St. Augustine. You really, your first stop is Charleston. And that's a lot of smaller boats or overland. Forget it. It's just brutal. And so by the time you get it there, you've lost so much of your profit. It just becomes not worth it. Um, but it's a great product if you can get it out. And the dye, is it a blue or purplish color? Depends. There are different varieties of indigo. The most common one grown here, most of the seeds, the original seeds for it, it bolts seeds very well once you, you know, establish a crop. Most of those came from on the Mississippi, native here. It's a native plant, a native weed around the world, and there's, uh, I think, 15 or 17, I don't remember, it's, that goes way back in my research, I think 15 or 17 varieties that you can make a dye from. Part of that is the type of water you use. Part of it is how long you let it ferment. Um, and you have to agitate it while it's fermenting. Um, so you can't just take unskilled labor and say, go make indigo, come back when you're done, you know. You needed skilled labor to do this. Um, and there, were a lot, there was a lot of skilled labor that came out of the Mediterranean because a big area of indigo production is the Mediterranean. Um, but, you know, you've got all these issues going on. Turnbull, I think they would have been successful. His original plan was to bring 500 Greeks to New Smyrna. And he prepared for that. He prepared his investors for that. He budgeted for that. And then he got greedy. Because for every head he brought over, he got land. He got land. So if you look at the early paperwork, you know, he was going to get 20,000 acres. And suddenly they're talking over 100,000 acres. Well, even today, that's a super farm, 100,000 acres, with mechanized, you know, big combines or plows or whatever. But if you're going to do that with hand labor, and I don't know about you, but when's the last time, I don't know, have you ever let your lawn kind of go a couple of weeks past <laughs> mowing time? It'd be one thing to go out there and clear your lawn and plant crops. Can you imagine, I mean, you've driven down the road, yeah. you know, out of town and looked at all those palmettas and everything. You've got to get all that out of there first. And then the weeds want to come back so fast. It's just crazy the amount of just sheer physical labor. So if you plan for 500, you build housing for 500, you bring in food supplies for 500, and then when you show up here, you got 1255. E you know, you're doomed. You're doomed from the get-go. Then you have years of drought, and then you have transportation problems. Your investors are starting to get really antsy because they've got five million dollars sunk into this. They want, where's, it's been six years, it's been five years. 
You know, just like people who have blue chip socks today. Where's my dividends? I'm flipping my coupons. I want to go to Disney World. Um, so they come from these uh, Balearic Islands. Here they are off the coast of Spain. For anybody who doesn't know where somebody people are always asking me this question. They don't know where they are. I'm like, well, there they are, right there. Today they're administered by Spain. Um, then at that time, Menorca was a British colony. Florida is a British colony, so that kind of whole thing, you know, don't need a passport for this. We can just pop on over. And from the get-go, I think one of the other big problems was cultural. I have got not only a history degree, but an anthropology degree, but at my heart, history is a wonderful thing. Um, but it's not wonderful because in 1492, Columbus said the blows to blue. I mean, I used to promise my students every semester, I will never make you remember more than six dates. I just won't. It's stupid. Why? You have to get me in the century. Either the beginning or the, the first half or the second half of a century. That's good enough for me. You need to know the flow of time. But another, I think, big mistake is Turnbull expected his people to take New Smyrna on as this big, lucrative um, quasi-experiment. But the first thing he did is rip the shreds of their life. I mean, look at these. These are from um, the Turnbull letter finds. And they're online. They're available. This map, I have a color. I was given, oh, thank God. They allowed me to make a big digital photograph of the original color one. And I have it at home, and it's beautifully framed. My sister, you know, beautifully framed this huge thing for me. And I'm sorry, even I don't allow that to leave the house in my hands, much less anybody else's. But here are the black and whites, and these are two scale surveys. And you see these little dots here? These little dots here? What are those? Those are here. You can see them better here. House. 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 Seven miles. So suddenly you take people who are used to living a Mediterranean lifestyle. What is that? You live in a walled city. Think of Europe. Walled city, walled city. Um, and during the day, if you know the marauders aren't close, you go out into the fields surrounding the city gate, the city walls, and you work your your plots and your farms and you raise your vegetables and whatever. But you come back at night, you come back for the festivals. Everything that's family, that's people, that's human, is inside the city, inside oops, wow, I don't know what I did, but groovy. Eh, not too bad. Everything is inside the insular nature of those walls. Those walls become like your family. You know, your cousin's there, your mother's sister there, you know, your, your, your niece who's having the baby. You know, the midwife is three houses down the street. Your godmother, you walk past her every day. The church is right there. The market is right there. It's not here. Where is the church? Here's the... Here's the um, you know, y'all are all from here. You know where the, um, um, help me. The wharf. The wharf is. Yeah. Well, there's the church. Okay. Here are the barracks. Because for the single men and some of the single women, they had some barrack storehouses when they had food to store. And certainly the indigo that they were, once they had it dried, it would go in here ready to ship out. But that's not... This has the potential of town center, but not when you're spread out like this. And if you're working from sun up to sundown in the Florida sun in June, that, that period is about 14 hours. And most of these people are working this family right here in this house, they're working this section. They're growing indigo in this section. This family, they're over here. So even when they're working, and of course they have work labor groups who get together to do land clearing and things like that. But the great majority of it is spread out like this. Totally, totally opposite of what they're used to. And look when they come to St. Augustine, what's the first thing they do? They clump together in town. They go back outside the city gates. Here's the Menorcan section of town in St. Augustine. 
Here's the fort. Everybody knows what the fort is. Uh, here's the city wall. Uh, city gates are about here. Yeah, right, right there. Oh no, that's them. They actually have them on there. Um, but here they are. Tonyan, Grant has to go back to England. He, uh, he's like Henry VIII. He uh, damaged his, he uh, injured his leg, and he never really, um, they never healed. They never recovered from it. This guy comes in, Tonyan. Um, he and he and Turnbull are like, it's awful. Mm -hmm. They just clash from the get go. It's politics. Um, Turnbull's angry because he expected to get to get either the governorship or, or a pretty high position, and probably if Grant had stayed, he would have. Um, Tonyan came in. You know, he's he's like a he's like a president coming into the White House. You he, he don't keep the old people. You bring your own people in to surround you. <laughs> Tony the same way, and he and uh, he and Turnbull just clashed from the get go. I mean, they really hated each other. It was just, oh uh, yeah, personal. And, and not only was it political and social, but it was personal with these two. And so, by the time the Menorcans bail out of New Smyrna, walked seventy miles. Although we came down US one today, it took almost as long as it took to go down. <laughs> we stopped it. But I was thinking about that. I'm like, oh my gosh, the Menorcans are going to beat us. Um, but Tonyan says, come on in. Your, your, your contracts are void. I don't care. If your indentured period was for three years or 30, I don't care. If he could, if he could stick it to Turnbull, it was a good day. I mean, I was Tonyan's on the line. And does he care about Menorcans? No. Does he love Menorcans? No. no. Oh my gosh, no. But when you're, when you're the governor of East Florida, what is one of the most important things? When you're the ruler of a land, this is my land. What's the most important thing that you hold on to the land? And what do you need to hold on to the land? You need bodies. You need people. You know, if you can put somebody on a house every so many feet, you got a much better chance of holding on to it. And Tonyan wants to hold on to this. He wants to make his political and military masters back in London happy. And they've got this big chunk of property. You know, by the time the Menorcans roll in, up here in north, you know, the northwest part of town, it's really just... The Spanish soldiers previously were housed here, their families were housed here, merchants and stuff like that. But by the time the, the British come, Spanish are all gone. And basically this is kind of an abandoned part of town. Housing is not adequate. Here they come again. They left the old world. They left everything and everybody they knew and went to New Smyrna. And they gave it a good, a good solid run there for a number of years, and finally we've had enough. And the bottom line, I think the Menorcans would have stayed in New Smyrna and stayed working with Turnbull if Turnbull had done one thing. Because one of the parts of their indenture contract, and no signed copy exists. We have one copy uh, unsigned, so kind of a blank one, but there's no signed copy. I'm sure those went down the 17th, 1700, you know, toilet as, qu as quick as they could. Especially when Tanyan said, come on down. But you take this Menorcan section, poor housing, you know, they, they came, by the time they leave New Smyrna, their numbers are down. 1255, when they got to New Smyrna, here they are, you know, in 1777, they're down to 600 people. The population had initially crashed and, and got a little better. And then the drought years, and you look at the, and the Catholic Church keeps wonderful records yay, on births and deaths and baptism and godparents. So suddenly, you can start finding people all over the place. It's wonderful. And we can look at the birth and death rates, and we're like, wow, they crashed again. We're talking crash. We're not talking, well, you know, whew, it was a rough week last week. You know, we lost Grandpa, and then we lost Uncle Edward. And yeah. no, we're talking a crash like a natural disaster, mm -hmm. like an earthquake or a flood, like one of those floods they have. And what's that place in Southeast Asia where they have the terrible floods? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm.
Bangladesh. Yes, Bangladesh. Thank you. I mean, we're talking cataclysmic, you know, for the numbers, for the over the percentages. Um, but they get here. I mean, some of them. I, I remember reading one. Um, I don't remember. It was in the Catholic Church records. Uh, a guy's living under a bush, basically. Um, wow. You've come all this way. You've worked all these years. The the indentured said, when you're done with your, the most accepted number is nine years. There's no way, because indentures were always flexible based on the um, training of the person. A blacksmith would sign an indenture for three years. He'd be done and go on his way into the new world. And being an indentured servant, I think the Menorcans as a whole still feel this is like a shameful thing. But if you look back at the history of North America, Canada down, and you look at European migration into the New World, um, during this period, um, until after the Revolutionary War is well over, the vast majority of migrants and labor force is indentured. It's, it's very common at the time. Slavery, you know, certainly slavery's been here since, you know, the first, you know, Spanish stepped ashore and subsequent the English and everybody else. Um, but it doesn't become uh, lucrative as a labor force until well after the Revolutionary War. So if you look at all those kind of pilgrims and Mayflower and Wilmington and um, all those other places that are so proud of their heritage, um, every stone you cook over has got an indentured servant under it. We are all related somewhere in our genealogy to at least one indentured servant, if not many. Yes. Oh, I thought you had one. Um, so here they are. So what do they do? Suddenly, the good thing about this is, look where they are inside the arms again with their families with their godparents <laughs> and you have to remember um for those of you um who are, who are not catholic or who are not latin american um godparents are a big deal yeah. now then a godparent was good as your parent they had not only religious obligations but social obligations financial obligations um, so to be back together again, and so what do they do during the day? Uh, Tonyan, Grant's gone. He doesn't need all this property anymore. And Grant is willing to lease it out. He still wants money for it. But these people have nothing. A lot of them came with just a shirt. I mean, half, they were half naked. Um, one of the biggest complaints, if you read the complaints um, the legal complaints about the ones who um, testified about their treatment in New Smyrna. Time after time, in every one of them, one of their biggest complaints is, we were poorly clothed. We were half naked. We didn't have enough clothing. But if you read the Turnbull letters, you really look at those bills of lading and stuff. I know, boring historical stuff. But if you read them, Turnbull actually ordered, you know, because my first thought is, what's he doing with all this cloth? I'm like, is his wife some kind of big seamstress or something? <laughs> Who needs 197 bolts of cloth? I'm like, what for? Well, they needed it to make clothes. Um, so finally when they get here, they've got nothing. So how are they suddenly leasing or buying property? Um, well, Grant, you know, some money is better than no money. And he was... Um, awfully used to turning goods into money, obviously very good at it. And so he said, if you lease this piece of property for a year, we'll do a 10% rate. 10% of everything you grow on here belongs to me. Norkins were like, well, great. What a great deal. And I can grow whatever I want. I can do whatever I want. Suddenly I'm free because Turnbull said to them, when your indenture's done, I'm going to give you 50 acres each per body. 
suddenly when this deal is going on, the women and children do count. Um, so if you're man and wife, you got four or five kids, suddenly you went from having a postage stamp if you're lucky in Menorca to a decade later, you know, you've got three, four hundred acres. I mean, you're, you're the king of your own castle at that point. So they get here and they start all over again. They start by going outside the city walls during the day and they start planting vegetables and then start doing other sustainable crops. Um, I'm like, well, I wonder what they're growing. What are they eating? Um, no Publix, nowhere to get groceries. So what are they doing? What are they growing? Well, something really cool, but at night, they're always coming back into their houses um, and living in the Menorcan Quarter. Um, this, this photograph, obviously a little later than this time, this mm -hmm. photograph is St. George Street mm -hmm. in St. Augustine from 1885. And if you have been there and seen the Menorcan plaque on the wall, yeah. the one they did, that's the wall that's on the Spanish Bakery. This is a Spanish Bakery building. And that plaque that they dedicated here on the coldest day of that year, of course, um, is actually on this wall. So I think it's a really cool picture of the Menorcan Quarter, but um, it doesn't look different at all from when they were there. Actually, it probably looks better than they were there. Um, so what happens is they start renting and leasing and then buying all this property north of St. Augustine. And this is where the beachside development comes in because this is obviously the ocean, but this is the Guana River, and this is uh, what the locals call the North River. It's intercoastal. Um, this was one of Grant's, this kind of alligator looking thing here. Here's the mouth open. Um, this piece of land here um, was one of Grant's um, experimental farms. He grew, he grew mostly indigo here. And he started here at this end, started growing indigo. And as the soil depleted, he would move back and, and move back and move back. Eventually, they got enough irrigation going, they were growing, that they could flood rice paddies. And they were growing rice here, too. Um, did quite well. Grant also did very well with rice, uh, which grows very well in this area. We don't, we don't grow much rice on this coast anymore, but uh, it used to be a lot of rice was grown in these areas. But this is where these plantations grew up. And these were all Menorcans. This is your upward movement. This is, I am once again going to drag my bootstraps up and find a way. So how do you, um, so once again, you're growing, first of all, rule number one, growing up for your, for your, for your family. Got to grow subsistence first is the first rule. Got to make the family survive. But man, this year we had a really good run on Irish potatoes. We got 30 extra bushels that we're not going to eat. Well, does, you know, Consuela need it? Does Uncle Juan need it? You know, no, let's take it to market. You know, suddenly we can buy some coffee or we can buy a new plow or we can buy a few new acres. And that's what they start doing and doing quite well until suddenly 1811 rolls around and the early parts of the War of 1812 in Florida, the Patriot War they called it in this area, come in and just once again knock these people down just as far as you can go. Because when the Patriots came down from the very new United States, because basically the War of 1812 was the second revolution. The British made another, made another try. And the Americans, which they have officially become now, they look south and what do they see? Well, they see, they already have Virginia. You know, the jewel and the crown, agriculture, they already have Virginia. And think of how many founding fathers come from Virginia. Yeah, and they already know how that works. They already know how to make money. So they look to Florida, which has a longer, more temperate climate. And what do you think? Oh my gosh. If we can grow tobacco once a year here, we can probably grow it three times a year in Florida. I didn't grow it all worth the darn. But we can also grow indigo and rice and those kind of things. So they turn and look at Florida 
and say, oh, we got to have that. We got to have us some of that. We need Florida. And so contingents of Patriot soldiers, um, some sanctioned, many others non-sanctioned, flooded in to Florida. And if you're going to take Florida in 1811, what do you have to take? Yeah, that's it. Jacksonville, there's no Jacksonville. You know, there's a, you know, there's not even the the Native Americans are gone. The last 114 left the Spanish 20 years earlier. Um, there's no Miami. There's some, you know, there's some people down at Key West, but you know, not enough to count at this point. It's St. Augustine. It's St. Augustine, Pensacola in West Florida. St. Augustine here. So if you take St. Augustine, you've got all. British East Florida. So all we got to do is take St. Augustine. There's just one little problem. The fort. fort was never taken. You shoot a cannonball at it, what does the fort do? Yeah, it just kind of, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it's just kind of like a big pimple. And, oh, it'll fall out eventually. Um, you hope. But it's there for a reason. But what else is the fort? Not only does it repel people, but what happens inside the fort? It saves people. I mean, uh, what year was Hurricane Dora? I never can remember. 58? Um, I think it was 58. So my, my, my mother was, you know, um, my grandfather was a historian. My adopted, this is my adoptive family. Was a historian at the fort. And... Um, here comes horrible Hurricane Dora. This is 1950-something. My parents had a really nice house. But where did they go when the hurricane was about to come on shore? They went to the fort. You know, my grandfather talks about carrying the oldest grandchild. He's gone now, but talks about carrying the, through the flood waters up to his waist and grandchild on his shoulders to the fort. Because if it stood this long, it's going to stand a while longer. When that Category 5 one just went by and we were so lucky the bombs weren't, I'm like, holy cow, there's too many of us now. We can't all get in the fort. But I was, I was thinking, <laughs> well, because it's going to be there. It's going to last. Well, during when the Patriot War comes, uh, they show up quick, fast, in a hurry. Um, all those planters up in Georgia and Virginia, they were outfitting their own little personal militias, so they were well well provisioned, they've got great horses, they've got great supplies, and they sweep down, they're going to take St. Augustine, oh, it'll take us a day and we'll be back. Kind of like, you know, the Germans going into Russia, oh, it'll take no time at all. Well, all those people up in those plantations now who are doing so well, all those Menorcans are doing so great along the river, they grab, you know, what's it you said today, one pair of drawers and a toothbrush. Uh, that's my crazy sister. And run for the fort. Holy crap, here they come. We're all going to die. Well, 14 months later, they emerge finally and go back to their plantations. And it was kind of a scorched earth thing. Part of it was, um, you know, the St. Augustine side needed clear sight lines for the cannon off the top of the fort. You know, just want to lob cannonballs and hope for the best, you'd like to see what you're shooting at. So part of that destruction was done by the locals where they could see where to shoot the cannon. But the American policy was kind of Stalin-esque in that it was kind of a, um, kind of that scorched earth kind of policy, you know. If we can't, you know, unnail it, you know, stuff it in a saddlebag or throw it in a wagon, we'll just burn it. <coughs> Um, you know, demoralizing, destruction, and all that kind of stuff. Um, so when they emerged 14 months later out of, the, out of the walled city and go back up, there's all kind of destruction. But in part of the treaty negotiations that followed the War of 1812, the, the actual treaty was the Adams Onus Treaty was the name of the treaty. But if you're reading there, there's a, there's a fun paragraph that said those properties that were damaged by American forces 
who intruded over international border because think about it Georgia Florida that was an international border you're gonna pay for it well all the Menorcans are like hallelujah we're saved <laughs> um, the treaty was signed at the end of the war 1813 early 1840 after they got all the politics and talking done uh, it actually doesn't get ratified until 1821. When 1821 rolls around, a lot of those people in a lot of these areas, in a lot of the, like this is John Segui and his plantation, he, he um, filed a claim. But actually John Segui didn't file a claim. His son Bartolome filed the claim. He was dead. But the descendants, the heirs, they kept up with what was going on. And I don't remember which Scottish writer, I think it was Sir Walter Scott, said after war, the Corbys come, the crows come and pick out the, the eyes of the soldiers dead on the battlefield. And who comes after the Corbys? The lawyers. I, I'm just saying what the, what, the, what the poet said, but he's right. Because after the war, and they cleaned up the battlefield and everything, then it was the lawyer's turn. And because you needed a lawyer to um, take your statement, to, to hear from your witnesses, to take your list, this is what got broke, this is what got stolen, this is what got burned. And so literally, oh, these beautiful surveys <laughs> at the Florida um, archives, you know, shows just Menorcan name after Menorcan name after Menorcan name after Menorcan name. And every one of them filed a claim, the Patriot War Claims. Because in the treaty it said, the United States government, you have to pay these people. You came over the line. You broke international law. Shame, shame, shame. And so, you know, in, the, in these reports from the witnesses, we saw burning at John Segui's farm from the fort. Well, sure, if you go up to the top of the fort, you can see up North River. But, you know, is that John Segui's barn or, you know, Roque Leonardi's barn or, you know. Pfft. So there was a lot of argument, a lot of contention back and forth. The lawyers, um, the first of these claims weren't paid until 1838. Oh, yeah. And I didn't find a single one that, but they all paid something. And the one was rejected outright. They all paid something, but on average, best case scenario, they get about half of what they sued for. Mm -hmm. So, in the average payment, about $538. Oh, no. um, yeah, but then, you know, they sued for $1,200. You know, we had a house, we had some outbuildings, uh, there's some really interesting stuff in there. And it gives us an idea to look into what they were growing, what they were eating, because if we think about the area today as a single crop, what is the one single crop in the area today? Tourists. Condos, tourists, you know. <laughs> and there's a Publix up there now, at you know, up, out there at Purpose Point, but I mean, nobody's growing anything up there. But if you think about it, it's a pretty good supermarket. Because what, what is there to eat? Pre-Publix. What you got in the ocean? How many Menorcans we got in here? I got to be careful with them. Oh, well. <laughs> Keep your seats. <laughs> Mullet on the beach. There you see. Now I know you're a Menorcan. So we got the mullet run this year. Have y'all seen any of this? It's unbelievable. We're having a great mullet run. Um, and even if you don't like mullet, you get hungry enough, mullet is good. <laughs> but you've got turtles and turtle eggs. To this day, even though it's illegal now and she would never do it, my mother swears to this day on a holy Bible that the only really good pound cake was her Mima's pound cake made with turtle eggs. Swears, swears by it. Um, you know, gophers, you know, gopher tortoises, you know, gopher stew. Mm, I don't like it. It's the claws in there that get to me. <laughs> Other people love it. Um, but oysters, clams, right there is a big old pile of protein. Um, Menorcans can grow anything in a five gallon bucket. I'm surprised y'all haven't been up here trying to plant daddle peppers already because there's two five gallon buckets. That's a Menorcan. But you've got, um, 
good water supplies up there. Several springs. You're that close to the beach, and that's surprising. Um, a guy I want to talk about here in just a couple of minutes. He talked to me. He used to build skeeters kind of take Model A's and model, early Model T's, this is back in the 40's, early 50's, um, and they'd turn them into like modified beach buggies. And they'd run from Ponte Beach or up to Jacksonville, all the way on the beach. Um, I can imagine doing that. But these old engines were old when he was using them, and I said, you know, he said, we'd run out of water after the first 10 miles. I said, well, how'd you fill your radiator back up? He goes, oh. If, you, if you're local, you know where the springs are. There's springs all up and down the beach. There's a place off the beach in St. Augustine. Oh, it's maybe a mile, mile and a quarter offshore. You can take a five-gallon bucket, dip it down the ocean, and it's the freshest water you're going to get in Florida. There's enough spring water bubbling off the bottom that there's a pool of fresh water out there in the middle of the ocean. So there's good water supplies. You've got all that ocean stuff. You've got the intercoastal, the North River, the Guana, lots of oysters, lots of clams. And then you go over one more step and you've got forest. And you've got venison and feral hogs and DeSoto. We're still eating today DeSoto's pigs. A number of years ago, one of DeSoto's pigs chased me up onto my mother's mailbox. <laughs> About 400 pounds. And I was young enough to still hop up onto a mailbox then. That was a long time ago. Um, but you got feral pigs, you got berries, um, all kind of medicine, medicinal plants going on out there. So if you're clever and you're hard working and you've been here for 10 years and New Smyrna, you know, plant wise, flora, fauna is the same as, you know, the North River area. There's no difference. You're going to run into the same plants, the same animals. So if you're flexible, and these people have obviously shown themselves to be plenty flexible, and if you're hardworking, well, of course you are. You want to eat. You're hungry. Um, suddenly, you can make a pretty darn good living. But we get this wonderful insight because not only did they say, you know, my barn burned, but they also said, hey, I was locked in the fort for 14 months, and I had an African slave and I would normally loan him out or hire him out. It's very common. You would hire slaves out. Um, think of the skilled labor. You know, slave labor built all those beautiful buildings in Washington, D.C. You know, they were stone masons and carpenters, and you could hire that out for a premium. I couldn't hire my slave out for 14 months. You owe me for that. I couldn't plant. Not only did I lose the crop that was in the ground and the crops that were stored in the corn crib, I lost the potential of the crop for the whole year we weren't here. So I'm going to sue you for all of it. And they did. But they were still lucky to get what they get. Um, yeah, this is a photo that came was taken in St. Augustine, once again from this 1885 collection. But I imagine this is fairly close, probably a little more upscale than they were at this time. But for some of those patriots, they had to describe their house in detail. We had glass in our windows. We had wooden sashes around our windows. Our windows and doors were painted. I had one that was painted red and green. I'm like, wow, <laughs> that's pretty fancy. But I imagine this would not have looked out of place at the time. And I love the goats. I think they're really cool. Right. Um, and if you go to St. Augustine today, you can find the same thing. You know, 12 Menorcans sitting on the side of the road. Usually they're, instead of the goats, it'll be a bunch of F-150s and stuff. But it's the, it's the same thing going on culturally. Um, that's another survey. This is Roque Leonardi's place up where, if you know where the St. Augustine Airport is, um, today, I think where your uh, the southern end of your airport is where the church would have been here. Um, I think some more serious work needs to be done with those surveys that came out of the Turnbull collection. Um, so that's all I have to say.